Um, okay, I'm presenting a lot of material today, so I will ask you to forgive me for rushing through the text I've written in preparation. Um, I'm very keen to hear all your uh, questions, feedbacks, and probably a lot of criticism too. Uh, but first of all, it is my pleasant obligation to thank the organizers of the Congress in general and the panel in particular for offering me this venue. It's my first time at ICMS, but due to the recent developments, I sure hope not the last. What I'm presenting you today is a capsule version of a second draft of a paper that I initially conceived almost a year and a half ago. My gratitude, therefore, further extends to the readers of the draft last autumn. And on this basis, I hope to submit a pair of two articles sometime soon after today's meeting. And therefore, I'm very open to any feedback, however harsh it might be, because I know that what I'm presenting today might sound a little unorthodox, if I may be bold. So in my PhD thesis, I uh, study the things of the uh, late Viking Age in both England and Scandinavia, though today I'm leaving the latter region out of discussion. Naturally, starting a research, one must identify its object. And in this instance, you might be expecting of me a definition of a thing, my own or previously established. In my exposition, I depart from two theoretical presuppositions. First, that things were indeed a social group open to historical research, and second, that it is best described in terms of an elite. Unlike original Latin and vernacular medieval lexis, the emotional and moral neutrality gives this term and, and its embedded concept flexibility and scientific applicability. This formulation, however, purposefully leaves out what this high social position is predicated on, as it is bound to vary in each individual instance. So in the broad sense, this paper aims at addressing such predications in case of the pre-Norman Thainly elite. So excluding scholarship on kingship and the king's relationships with their, their own courts, the existing literature usually offers two general ways of explaining who or what things were. In the historically older prescriptive approach, it is most commonly grounded in the legal order and their supposed determining attribute is then declared their, their high wiggled of 1,200 shillings, or six that of a commoner, a churl. In more recent works, however, a descriptive approach is preferred, in which things are loosely described as aristocracy, nobility, elite, office, or high rank, on a par with the later medieval gentry. Naturally, this is a simplification and perhaps slightly artificial separation on my part, but it is quite often that the 1200 shilling Weigild is said to be the thing's characteristic feature in both approaches. An implicit attractiveness of such attribute is the wealth of re references to both the 1200 people and things in the West Saxon legislation. Seeing them as different verbal expressions of one and the same idea will significantly enrich our knowledge of the pre-conquest social conditions. But let us now reassess what this idea actually rests upon, shall we? So when boiled down to its source, this idea finds unequivocal support in merely two pre-1066 texts, the North Lea de Laha and Mirkna Laha, both elements in Archbishop Wilson's compilation on status. In addition, two later Norman compilations, the so-called Legis Hendeki Perime and Leis Wilhelmi, also contain similar phrases. Furthermore, things appear in at least four late renditions of a common formula, commoners and noblemen, seemingly synonymous with the legal 1200. Finally, because the Mirkna Laha purports to report Mercer norms, the sum in the Weigel in question has sometimes been counted as 4,800 pence according to the Mercer reckoning of 4 pence in 1 shilling, as opposed to the West Saxon ratio of 5 to 1, and this sum has been found on two other occasions too. On the surface, these pieces seemingly amass an overwhelming proof that a thing's wiggle was indeed 1200 shillings. Or do they? However, cursory, I will try now uh, to demonstrate why this is more a house of cards than a solid building of evidence. Well, let's begin with the indirect testimonies. First, the Norman translations or adaptations. They are post-conquest, and therefore, as Bruce O'Brien commented in his very recent talk at the Law and Transmission Workshop, it is a million dollar question of how much of the earlier genuine tradition each of them actually contains. In case of the Legis Henrique Primi, the author was clearly familiar with Wilson's text and the compilation on status in particular, 
so his testimony cannot be taken as independent. With the Leis Wilhelmi, I join Patrick Wolmel's apt characterization thereof as an intellectual exercise. On top of everything, as with the Comoran nobleman formula, I suspect that in the Anglo-Norman compilations, we are dealing with the lexical evolution of the word thing semantics, and not a legal fact. A telling case can be provided by the text provisionally called by Felix Liebermann, Wergeldzahlung, and believed by Wolmel to belong to King Edmund's reign. The text lays out the procedure of paying Weigeld for a 1200 person and concludes that, I quote from Wolmel, with a child's Weigeld, everyone shall proceed along the lines proper for him, as we reckon for 1200 men, end quote. The unknown author pairs Charles with the 1200, not with Thanes. In the interest of time, I will have to ask you to believe my honest word, well, based on my work with the Old English Corpus, actually, that on the lexical level, by the turn of the millennium, the lexim Thane had indeed undergone an observable widening of its range of meanings and became one of the everyday synonyms to denote the top lay social stratum. If anything, the four instances in question, all very late, by the way, are a linguistic evidence to this process and bear no testimony for a thane wiggled as a legal phenomenon. The next argument will require us to close our eyes to the fact that the 1200 shilling wiggled is known exclusively from Wessex. I will be generous and play the devil's advocate and consider the two texts that seemingly provide evidence if we reckon the thane wiggled at the Merson rate of four pence to one shilling both were familiarized to the case by Henry Chadwick in 1905, but since then only rarely reappeared in works dealing with Thanes. One is Scottish and is conventionally called the Legis Interpretus at Scotus. Contrary to the 19th century scholarship, the source's latest editor and commentator, Alice uh, Taylor, believes that the Legis contained little or no pre-1100 legal tradition. But irrespective of this, the text provides a whole list of Weigels, and among them that of a Thane. Using the text on monetary system, the figure we're giving converts exactly to 4,800 pence. But even if we can see that despite a very chaotic provenance, the extant text has preserved some original mid 12th century material, it does not follow that it has any bearing on the Anglo Saxon Weigel tariffs. For one thing, for our period, the Legis are even later than the Norman compilations discussed above. For the other, converted to pence, the Wurgels in the Legis have no matches in the English system apart from that of a Thane. For the third, Taylor has made a convincing case that the Latin Thanos in Scottish documents was likely not a direct borrowing from English, but rather a learned translation of some native Gaelic terms for a high status, presumably Toisach, though this requires a certain leave of faith. Occam's razor says no, too many concessions are required to take this very late and contradictory evidence for a proof of a much earlier Anglo-Saxon thing, the of 1200 shillings. The other text is called uh, Succintus Dialogus Ecclesiasticae Institutiones, or Dialogus for short. It was written somewhere in the mid 8th century by the Archbishop of York, Edgbert, and it is a normative Latin text in question and answer format. Relevant to my purposes today is question 12, which inquires into the procedure for paying the Weigel for the killing of clerics or monks. Edgbert's response, Prescri prescribes payment to the church of uh, eight, six, and 400 sickly for killing, killing a priest, deacon, or a monk, respectively. Um, I'm not sure if my, uh, if the, uh, if you can see only my slides, but, or also you, in, let's see, let's see this way, okay. Uh, so, Chadwick implicitly understood Siclus to be an alternative form of Sicilicus, a later Roman unit equal to a sixth scripula. Assuming that the Northumbrian coin at the time was minted at the weight of a scripulum, Chadwick concluded that the 800 Sicli represented the value of 4,800 uh, pence. Chadwick then explained this sum as the Thane's Weigeld, I quote, for elsewhere we always find the priest and the Thane put on an equal footing in this respect, uh, end quote. In 1905, Chadwick couldn't have known that all such comparisons are found in the much later Wolstanian text alone, on which I'm going to comment slightly later. More importantly, Chadwick's explanation appears somewhat at odds with the Dialogus's textual evidence itself, reporting the Wergeld of a monk as quadragente argentei in the same sentence suggests that Edgbert understood cyclus as a synonym of argenteos, both meaning simply silver coin. 
in question 8, for instance, the fine for sacrilege imposed on the laity should be, I quote, twice the sum of 30 sickly, that is, we wish that the adulterers give the church 60 argentea. So, yes, the dialogue seems indeed to use the mercy rate, but casts no light on the thingly wiggled because the 800 sickly sum translates to the 200 shilling wiggled. Once again, Occam's razor and textual critique say no. So that leaves us the big one, the compilation on status by Wilson and his constituent elements, the North Laodalaha, or the NL, and Mirknalaha, or ML. What is essential here is to treat these both texts not at their face value, but, following Dr. Rabin's brilliant analysis, as integral parts of a bigger one. Stylistically, the NL falls into two identifiable parts, a supposed Northumbrian core, and unmistakable additions by Wollstone starting from paragraph 7, in which he is obviously recycling King Ina's stipulation and stipulations and even vocabulary, such as the word Yezith. Paragraphs 1 to 6, or the said supposed core, lay out the Weigels for different ranks in presumably the Northumbrian society. Paragraphs 1 through 5 count them in Thrymses, uh, an otherwise vague currency in which in a moment. Paragraph 5 stipulates that the 2000 Thrims Wurgels of a Thane of the Mass, i.e. priest and a secular Thane, and paragraph 6 then equates the Charles Wurgels of 266 Thrimses to 200 sh uh, Mercian shillings. Knowing the values of the West Saxon and Mercian shillings and using some simple arithmetics, we get the desired quantity of 1200 shillings for a Thane Wurgels, which is then reinforced already in the second clause in the ML which, uh, where for the first time ever do we actually read black and white, according to the law of the Mercians, a layman's Weigeld is 200 shillings, the Weigeld of a Thane is six times as much, that is 1200 shillings. By the way, what is actually a thrims? As a matter of fact, outside the NL, this name for money appears in but seven sources in the whole extant corpus. To save me some time, I'll have to leave that treatment to the recapitulation on the slide and jump to the conclusion, namely that by the late 10th century, Thrims was hardly a living monetary term in everyday circulation, and only sporadically used to convey the sense of antiquity. The switch in the spelling in the NL is probably caused by the contamination of the Old English three and the Latin tres, which also accounts for the assumption of the meaning three pence. So, to recap, in all likelihood, the author thought of Weigel amounts as values attached to the numbers of shillings in them. The West Saxon tariff system appears as the reference point in his calculations. It also seems very probable that he was familiar with the two ways of reckoning pence to shillings. To somehow equate the systems, the otherwise bizarre figure of 266 thrimses must have been added in paragraph 6. That still, however, doesn't answer the question of the inclusion of the absolute thrimses in the first place. Furthermore, in order to harmonize the evidence, a chain of mutually dependent concessions is required. It is impossible to ignore the inconsistency of the Thane and Charles Weigel ratios, 6 to 1 in the ML, but 7.5 to 1 in the NL. But even then, a sudden switch of currency within adjacent lines must be conceded, so that the Charles Weigel in paragraph 6 is reported in Mercian shillings, but the Thanes in paragraph 5 in West Saxon shillings unexpectedly converted to the otherwise obscure thrimses. Because I'm running out of time, I will have to spoil the intrigue and offer my hypothetical explanation to this conundrum up front. It is this. Both the NL and ML were drafted by Wilson from the very beginning, and the supposed core is only a phantom. I know it sounds very unorthodox, but here are my arguments. Well, first, the dating and regional localization. The Norse borrowing hold, often taken as a terminus postquem, uh, for the NL is only scarcely attested in Old English, its earliest occur occurrence falling on the year 901 and the latest somewhere late in the reign of King Ethelred or early in Canutes. The inclusion of a, a King's Wiggle itself doesn't rule out a late composition, it could have been added at basically at any point. Conversely, as a technical term, the word Etheling probably took sh shape during the West Saxon 10th century hege uh, he hegemony. The King's High Reeve is a West Saxon way of calling the Northumbrian rulers. It first appears in the Alfredian common stock of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, and then mostly at the end of the century. With the ML using the same mention of the King's 
waggled as a terminus antequem, forces us to assume that the Norse borrowing of Lahu occurred as early as the 880s, and then sat suspiciously idle for at least some 50 years when it finally reemerges in 1 Athelstan. Furthermore, as I mentioned earlier, the word Thane began to be opposed to churl only towards the close of the 10th century, and it is thus unlikely that the wording in paragraph 1 could be much earlier. On top of everything are the spellings in the extant manuscript that show, manuscripts that show no sign of the Mercian or Northumbrian dialects. Taking the side of the devil's advocates again, I could postulate that what we have is a late West Saxon recension of a lost protograph, but hardly. The Corpus Christi College 201 and 190 feature the same spelling as the early 12th century Textus Rufensis, which is well known for preserving the archaic Kentish dialectal forms. Occam's razor protests against the early dating and Mercian and Northumbrian origin. Despite the low-key style, which is indeed not characteristic of Wollstone, internal evidence further suggests that both texts are nevertheless permeated by his ideas and lexical preferences. The lexeme Mars Thane doesn't occur anywhere else in the corpus but is echoed in a specific Wolstanianism, Wherefore Thane, that is, the Thane of the altar. Similarly, World Thane is also unique to the Archbishop's Idealic, as is the insistence on legal parity and privileges between a Thane and a priest. The apposition of Archbishop to Atheling and Bishop to Elderman resembles similar pairings in Wilson's Grieg. The hierarchy king, then Archbishop or Etheling, then Bishop or Elderman, is, fur is further fully present in Canus Law Code, also, as we all know today, written by Wollstone. And the very compound North Leoth uh, could, in theory, mirror a similar construction North Engle in Grief. As for the ML, Dr. Rabin rightly observes that the absence of pronounced verbal cues, often taken as a sign of Wilson's editorial hand. However, what makes the ML inseparable from the NL is firstly the repetition of the king's double wiggle expressed in nearly identical words, and secondly its identical numerical value of 30,000, though I grant the currency is not the same. Going one step further, we might even identify the potential source of inspiration for this figure. Under the year 694, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle reports a monetary compensation to King Ine from the people of Kent for their previous murder of a West Saxon royal. The figure is given at 30,000 of unknown currency, which resembles the stipulations in the compilation. Well, if this reasoning is correct, this helps explain the insertion of the 266 theorems as alien to the rest of the schedule. Um, yeah. This is the slide I wanted. As Dr. Rabin wrote, I quote, the parallel references to a Charles Weigold in North Leo de Laha 6 and 12 strengthen the connective tissue between North Leo de Laha and the subsequent text in the compilation, Mirtna Laha, which echoes the North Leo de Laha 6 in its opening clause, end quote. So essentially, Wilson chose to explain Thrims through the Mercian shilling simply because the following section in the compilation was Mirkna Laha and not, well, let's say, West Saxna Laha, that this arithmetic could have been, uh, could have caused a potential monetary disparity must have paled in comparison to the symbolic importance of the 200 shilling Weigeld of a churl as a Twihunde person. The same holds true for the symbolism of 30,000. But why did he need Thrimsis in the first place? This leads me to the neat conclusion of my source criticism. In a recent article, Dr. Rabin demonstrated Wilson's familiarity with the much earlier 7th century Kentish legal corpus and identified two likely purposes for recycling it. Firstly, it, I quote, initially functioned for Wollstone as a source of moral and legal precedent upon which he could draw in the course of his emerging project of social regeneration. Next, it, I quote again, enabled Wollstone to ground what may have appeared as legislative innovation in the legal traditions of the conversion era, end quote. On the strength of the employment of archaic vocabulary, such as Thrims and Yezith in paragraph 11, reference to previously recorded praxis in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, and copying and adapting from previous West Saxon legislation in paragraphs 7 and 9, the supposed Mercian and Northumbrian laws could be seen as part of the same program. Indeed, 
This would not be the first time Wollstone resorted to historical legal fiction to present his vision as rooted in the old tradition, as is evidenced by his Laws of Edward the Elder and Guthrum, one of his earliest specimens of the genre. Perhaps the NL and ML were Wollstone's deliberate attempt to impose the original West Saxon tariff system north of the River Thames and to harmonize various traditions throughout the kingdom in accordance to his vision of a holy society. I will conclude by asking why Wollstone was so bent on the Virgos and what it actually tells us about the things as an elite group in the Anglo-Saxon society. Attention, I think, should be drawn to the central importance of Virgo to the Anglo-Saxon legal system as a whole. On this slide, I have followed Carol Howe and listed the crimes connected to it. By and large, Weigel appears to have functioned as a decisive factor in assigning persons their ranks in the terminological sense. As such, rank largely overlaps with the German concept of der Stand, or economic, social, and juridical status group, which, to quote Patricia Krohn in, I quote, uh, pre-industrial society, tended to be just as sharply differentiated in terms of wealth as they were in terms of power and prestige, but they owed their wealth to their position in the hierarchy, not the other way around, or that at least was the principle. To recap, Weigold largely indicated a person's supposed standing in the community as a whole, and as such ought to have been of paramount importance for Wilson's ideology and fixation on the orderly society. But the actual social reality must have been much less tidy than he would have wanted. The social dynamics of the 10th century, likely accelerated through a reward in form of lavish land donations, led to the royal servants in effect becoming a hereditary aristocracy, whose social recognition was secured not by 1200 shilling Weigold, but through practical living up to certain social expectations. This is the impression left by the references in the royal laws, for the most part descriptive rather than prescriptive. In colloquial praxis, the process, this process spurred a semantic widening of Thane mentioned above. In everyday life, however, some churlish parvenus would have differed little from the people in the royal service, provided they too met the social expectations of aristocratic qualities. This was probably especially apparent north of the Thames, where the number of actual king's things uh, was shrinking proportionally to the distance from the West Saxon heartland. All this inevitably led to conceptual confusion, the entangling of which could have been Wilson's motive for drafting the NL and ML in, and presenting them as archaic local customs. To better drive home my final conclusion, I'd like to resort to Tim Timothy Reuter's apt terminological distinction of nobility, or people, I quote, whose normal privileged status is legally defined, and aristocracy, or those, I quote again, who exercises power as the result of being well-born in a socially rather than legally defined sense. Otherwise than a royal servant, Thane was a general, um, uh, Thane as a, as a general legal ontology, or in Wilson's language, Thanericht and Thaneware, seems to have never existed outside the Archbishop's writings. Thane as a factual social ontology, or elite in modern social terms, was, however implicit, quite real and remains researchable. To loop back to the name of our panel, at this stage of my research, I believe that in late Anglo-Saxon England, Thane was a de facto elite social status that had been ultimately derived from an office of a king's servant, some holders of which in practice could have been of noble rank, but eventually reimagined as and ultimately tied to such a noble rank only by legalist to the bone Wollstone and in his doctrine of a holy society. Thank you.